Hello and welcome everyone to the Build an Adventure Workshop. Uh, I am Vanessa Hoskins, a developer at Paizo and the Narrative Team, and uh, today we have we have some shenanigans for you. Uh, we are going to be doing a, a mock of what sort of happens in our narrative team meetings when we're deciding what the next big adventure path is going to be uh and we are going to include you now there is going to be significantly more shenanigans happening in this one than in usual but still i think we're all going to have fun uh let's meet my fantastic uh panelists that are, are with me starting with my boss and a wonderful person linda oh thanks vanessa uh, hi, I'm Linda Zayas Palmer. I am the development manager for the narrative team, and I have the privilege of working with all three of my fellow panelists. I'm John Compton. I'm a senior developer working on the Pathfinder Adventure Path lines. Um, my main role, other than working on Adventure Paths, is to uh, say, are you sure? To Josh and Vanessa. <laughs> <laughs> Muted, Josh. Josh, your son isn't here. <laughs> Everyone check the bingo box. <laughs> yep. This is good, because I get to do Josh's introduction. Hi, I'm Josh Foster. I, I work on adventure, uh, Pathfinder <laughs> Society, quest mission scenario things. Sometimes John tells me, are you sure? <laughs> As he should. It's going to be a good panel, because I get to do all of Josh's dubbing. <laughs> That's oh, hard. No. <laughs> I don't know why this is muted. Hey, oh, you are not oh, muted. Oh, we got you. You're back. You're back. Is that working? Yes, yes. it is. I don't know <laughs> what happened in the short time that we were away. But it's, Me uh, neither. Yeah. Tell I mean, us who you are. Sorry about that. I'm Josh Foster. I'm uh, on the organized play side of narrative. Uh, so I will be representing the short form shenanigans today. Uh, I, I tend to head up the quest line mostly, but I'm brought in to do other things as well. That's fantastic. Now, before we get started, uh, I did have a small disclaimer that I, I should probably share with you to make sure that we're covered, you know, legally. Paisa would like to state that the content of this panel is entirely shenanigans, which are unlikely to be presented in any published material and are entirely for entertainment purposes. All art displayed is owned by Paizo Inc., but none of it is used within the context of its original depiction. Viewers may notice substandard background removal on art pieces that is not up to Paizo's usual high standards. All substandard background removal is the fault of Vanessa Hoskins, who is not in Paizo's art department. Please direct any questions, complaints, or suggestions about the substandard background removal to notgoingtoreadthis at paizo.com. Please enjoy these shenanigans responsibly. <laughs> Knew it was a mistake to accept that email address. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to kick this off, uh, Vanessa. Um, so I, I think in order to keep our conversation uh, tight, like narrowed to very specific sort of, of topics, um, we're going to do it with a, a multiple choice format with some input by our fantastic audience in the chat. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. First, we need to choose a theme. Uh, today's themes we will choose from airships, time travel, or plane hopping. All right, we have airships, time travel, and plane hopping. So start talking about what you want to do. Panelists, what do you think is, is an intriguing theme for an adventure, wh whether long or short form? Well, one, one thing I'll jump in uh, is that when we're looking at uh, designing adventures, we're thinking about uh, not just what's going to be a great story, but what's going to do something really interesting for our brand and our setting. So when I look at these different options, I see Airship could be sort of a travel, travel log style thing where we're jumping between lots of different locations. Um, and I could see plane hopping also as, uh, being interesting because it gives us an opportunity to look at various uh, outer and inner planes beyond our normal like Lost Omens inner sea scope. So both those kind of uh, speak to me a bit, whereas time travel, you know, could certainly be exploring some other interesting stories, but might not be quite as much of that, that brand building and, and uh, exploration aspect. Interesting. I yeah, no, I think that, you bring up a uh, good point. Sorry. 
Got I would see that. that if you're going for the brand building idea and time travel, what you might see is something where you're going back in time to a, a significant time in Goldarian's history and then fleshing that out more. Although time travel, time travel can always be tricky because there's the question of, you know, when you change the past, how do you influence the future or how, what, how does information flow or are you going to unravel the time stream entirely? And the other two, yeah, definitely both have more of an exploration focused theme. So these could go into all sorts of, uh, all sorts of different places. And I also wonder with the airships, if it would be then exploring, you know, the, was it be exploring something about the spreading of airship technology or would it be something more where the PCs have an airship that most folks don't? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, and, oh, you go ahead, Professor. Well, I was going to say that it's, it's interesting what you talk about uh, trying to make the decision on are airships getting prolific or are they still quite rare as they are with the, the current stated canon. And that is one of the things that I think we would often talk over to the lore team as well and get them involved before we were like, so we're just going to decide that every nation is sponsoring an airship and we're doing this thing uh, because that changes the world quite significantly. And so that's one of those examples of uh, where we get to work with other departments to sort of set a direction for the brand. What were you going to say, Josh? Uh, for me, when I'm looking at uh, sort of a, an adventure brainstorm, just like a single sentence thing or a phrase, uh, I'm thinking, what what will the PCs be doing? Because the stuff I work on isn't going to have quite the impact as an AP does on the setting. Over an entire season, uh, you can get that in organized play. But a single adventure doesn't have that brand impact. So a lot of times is I'm looking at, uh, so we're, we're doing airships. What are the PCs going to be doing on that airship? Uh, how did they get there? Why do they want to be there? Why does the player specifically, not even the character, want to be there? Uh, same for the planes, definitely with time travel too. And that's, that's sort of the perspective I'm bringing in. And I think all of these have plenty of ways that characters and players would want to engage. I think I, yeah, I, think I have uh, an idea of where we can take this, because I'm looking at chat and I'm seeing a distressing number of people shouting airships. Um, <laughs> so um, w one, of, one of the other things that comes to mind, especially from an adventure path, or even, even like a, a standalone adventure, uh, like hardcover perspective, is that um, sometimes when we are creating adventures, we look at locations or major plot points that aren't the PCs, and we start to look at them not as objects, but as additional characters to the story. And so from an airship perspective, I see that there's really a lot of potential to be saying, okay, how can we not just incorporate this airship, but how can we make sure that it is in fact feeling like a character or a part of the story itself? So one of the things that's, uh, that I'm intrigued by is, for example, let's say this were a three-part adventure path um rather than giving the pcs the airship at the very beginning we kind of we kind of uh, look to a a classic um vehicle trope which is like the story of how the pcs got to the thing in the first place if we look at starfinder's mm. first adventure path like the acquisition of their first starship is in fact part of the story um but for this kind of your point about like you know are we giving every single nation an airship? On what does that do to our yeah, setting? Right. <laughs> what, what if the first volume of this hypothetical adventure path is in fact the PCs exploring a crashed airship? It's kind of like a little bit of Numeria Silver Mount stuff, but that first mm -hmm. adventure uh, in the series is really the exploration and potentially repair, rehabilitation, and adoption of that airship which then mm. allows the rest of you to take the next two volumes to go be Sky Pirates or whatever the hell you do. <laughs> and uh, when you talk about repair, too, that, that implies that there could be some degree of customization with your airship. Are you yeah. going to be having, you know, airship-to-airship yes. airship battles, and then you're going to prioritize your defense, you're going to prioritize your cannons, you're going to prioritize your speed. And uh, what kind of propulsion method are you going to be using? Is this going to be something that's based off of, uh, you know, Stasian technology, Numerian technology? Is it going to be mm, like magic from another plane? Is it going to be like the kinds of <laughs> things that the Shori used to use to power their sky cities? How are you going to power yeah. this thing? And that brings into mind obtaining fuel. Could that be uh, many parts of the adventure of making sure you're, you're able to keep that stocked? You're going to have to raid uh, sites using those technologies. 
Yeah, when I think yeah. about like the Reign of Winter adventure path, that was one where, sure, you have your chicken hut, but in a way, it, it has its own special fuel. You need whatever the token is that will fuel the hut to get to the next location. So the idea of it not just being, congratulations, you're playing Final Fantasy VII, you have the airship, go wherever the hell you want. Instead, it's a, <laughs> you have the airship, it's taking you, you know, you're heading toward the next place, and it only gets you two-thirds of the way there. Deal with it. How are you going to... Now we're back to the futuring, um, where it's like, how are you going to get back to 88 miles per hour in order to get your airship off right. the ground? <laughs> That's a good point. I think uh, that is a good plot point that we can use in an adventure, something like a fuel when you have a vehicle like this, um, and, and repairs to it, maybe a park... Uh, part gets broken and you have to find the right kind of material to replace it um, and you can make that part of uh, part of the MacGuffins that the PCs are looking for along the way it has a lot of options. Uh, speaking of airships, chat looks like they definitely want to see an airship based adventure and we've all been talking about it so I think that's good. Uh, do y'all want to try and narrow down our theme a little bit more? Yeah, sounds good. Oh. Seems, seems reasonable. Yeah, uh, okay. one, one thing that comes to mind for uh, adventure planning is, is, is not just the starting point, um, mm -hmm. like if we have a crashed airship, but what we want the end point to be. And this is particularly important for adventure paths, where we're often oh, yeah. looking at, like, what is the impact to our setting for completing this adventure path? Um, you know, are you, are you changing this local government? Are you, um, you know, running your own castle by the end? What, whatever it is. So... That's one of the things that I want to make sure that we're pinning down in the course of creating this adventure. It, it, I'm, I'm assuming this is a three-part adventure path just because it, mm -hmm. it, it gives us some sure. room to play. Um, but like, what is, what's the end state that we might have for this airship adventure? It, so that means that it probably isn't just a like, travel around the world, see some things, but accomplish X. Right. No, I think that's a good point. Um, a lot of our long form adventures always try to have some larger impact on the world at large, whether that's in Starfinder or in Pathfinder. And so it does seem important that you'd want to figure out that end goal. And I think right, this cool. uh, narrowing yeah. of the theme is going to help us uh, is going to help us figure out that out too by figuring out more about who the PCs are okay. and what they might be trying to accomplish. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, let's take a look at what our, our options are. As I said, we're just narrowing this down. So we've got Sky Pirates, a race, or how about exploration? Just do exploration for exploration's sake. So it's Sky Pirates, a race, or exploration. I think each of these offer a very uh, sort of different feel for an adventure when it, when it comes to what sort of content you're going to put in there and what sort of stakes we're talking about. Yeah, and, and just to explore the Sky Pirates and race thing in opposition to each other for a sec, they're, they're approaching sure. things from kind of a separate side of the coin because Sky Pirates tends to promote a very sandboxy um, perspective or storytelling, um, whereas a race has very distinct start and end points. It's, it's very much more on the rails. Um, mm -hmm. So that, just deciding between those two uh, as, as a false dichotomy um, could be a matter of us thinking like what how 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 tight of a story how sandboxy of a story do we mm. want true absolutely mm -hmm. and another thing that uh, if we're going to compare two options uh, the both exploration and the pirates as opposed to the race uh, sort of bring in more of that you customize your ship you're building it out the ship is the character uh, that's growing with you. Whereas a race, a lot of times is you're you're just hurrying. You don't necessarily have time to like sit in the shop for a bunch of downtime uh, to to build up your cannons or uh, engines or what have you. Uh, whereas sky pirates and exploration, I think that would definitely feature in more. So if you want something where customizing the ship is more of your thing, I would lean towards those mm -hmm. two as opposed to race. But if you don't want those elements, race really uh, doesn't need them. If you don't race want to you... customize your ship, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we do want to customize your ship. I imagine if it was a longer race, <laughs> but uh, with exploration too, uh, 
one thing that this makes me think is maybe that there's some area that the airship lets you access that other things wouldn't. So there's some kind of warding against getting there via magic and the peaks are too tall and foreboding to get there feasibly via land. Mm -hmm. So the airship is letting you get to something you wouldn't otherwise be able to get to, or like there's some, you know, city, a castle in the sky you're getting to, or some other location that the goal is to, you know, explore that location and gain the information that's within. And then you learn about some other thing that's going on that you then go and deal sure. with, or like, you know, the, you, you unseal something by accident when you're exploring things and then you go deal with that, or you decide to, or you have some kind of decision to make. And I'm, I'm one kind thing of, I kind of from, go for it. Vanessa. Oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say one thing that's interesting about these themes, um, sky pirates is like, very combat focused obviously right you're going to be raiding uh you know some chalaxian freighter or whatever you're doing um or maybe you're trying your you know andoran eagle knights trying to chase down some sky pirates either way it's very like er combat heavy feeling race is almost can be friendly it can have rivalries but also it can have people that you're working with um perhaps together from another team uh or just meeting npcs on a a not necessarily uh, violent basis. So I kind of like raced in a way to encourage uh, like cooperation and encourage making uh, good relationships with other NPCs and not just being purely adversarial versus exploration. Uh, I think about like the NPCs you're going to meet if you're exploring, you're, you're probably going to explore an area and move on. Uh, and it doesn't offer a lot of long-term relationship building with these other NPCs. So what do you think about that? I, I hear that. Um, one of the things, uh, so one of the, uh, I, I hear the point on the, uh, a race gives you kind of a, a set of people that you might be traveling alongside. This is certainly one where uh, outside of this panel, uh, if we were pitching this, this would be one where the <laughs> uh, setting folks would, uh, we'd be touching base with them a lot and be like, are you cool with us giving a whole bunch of airships to a whole bunch of people so we can have this race? Um, uh, but uh, I, I, I hear the point on the exploration where it's like, okay, we might just hit a point and then move on. I think one of the things that we might be missing for exploration is that of the three, it is the one that I feel has the most flexibility when it comes to the why. Um, mm. Because it could just be, we gave you an airship, go travel around the things and because, I don't know, you're, you're, you're PCs. Um, but there's always the potential of having like a sponsor, somebody who is some, some other authority or power or, or need um, that is driving where you are exploring and why, um, which might be kind of a little bit more to Linda's point of like, are we checking out some place that is otherwise difficult to access? And if we are accessing that point, is it just so that we can see what the tallest mountain is? Or is it because there's something there that um, is crucial to the well-being of us or other people? Yeah. yeah. What? When I think about the race idea, too, uh, one thing that we we didn't have locked in here, but that we would have in one of our other planning meetings is the length of the adventure, because race is really yeah. an idea that could be, you know, you could have a scenario that is a four hour adventure and that's a race. Um, whereas mm -hmm. if the race was the entire three part adventure path, like that would be a lot for a single race. So it would be more, you know, are you doing something where it's a, a race to different checkpoints? Are you like in mm -hmm. a racing league where you're trying to, Ooh. you're trying to move your way up the ranks cool. and you're discovering certain like things along idea. the way. And like John was saying too, what is motivating you in the first place to be doing these races? Are you trying to do this for glory? Is there some greater prize that you're going for? Um, does it, does it vary depending upon which race you're doing? And, and just quickly to jump in one more time on Linda's point, because uh, one of the last adventures that was being put up for Starfinder uh, before I changed teams was Redshift Rally, <laughs> which is a, a racing themed adventure. And one of the considerations that went into that is exactly Linda's point, like, what is the scope? And to an extent, how long can some can an adventure maintain a theme and keep it fresh? Um, I think this is kind of one of the the occasional uh, critiques of Extinction Curse, where it's like a whole bunch of entertainer, entertainer circus times uh, for the first several volumes, and then it's less so later on, uh, which is as far as I'll go right. on the spoiler side of things. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> it's, can, do, do we feel confident that we could keep up the racing energy and novelty through the scope of a, for example, three-part adventure path? Right. I have another uh, thought on the novelty too. Um, 
maybe you don't start with airships, but you have what you're mm. racing, but you start with some other vehicle and you eventually move your way up into the league where you have an airship and are racing them. Mm. And that can That's keep the really idea cool that idea. John was saying how you don't start with an airship in the beginning. Mm. The, yeah, and the airship the gets of, to become yeah. one of the, the, the characters. What's that, Josh? Yeah, on, on the point of, of the league, which I had not considered, uh, that also brings in the uh, build up your ship more. Because, yeah, maybe not in the middle of a race you're doing that, but if you have multiple races, uh, and maybe even it's where like you tune it up to where it becomes an airship. So you started out with some sort of ground or water vehicle, and you, you finally earned these propulsion systems to get into the Super Ultra Grand Prix or whatever more interesting name you would call it. <laughs> and so you're, you've oh, yeah. got that character who's stuck with you this whole time, your ship, but now they're flying. Isn't that cool? Mm hmm that is cool. Uh, I saw that Tim C. Uh, Aon in chat says airship is maybe the secret prize for the first book's race, which I think is kind of a cool idea. So that way the first book you're like Josh was saying, maybe you're just having watercraft and then the thing that you get uh, as a reward is an airship or one that can, you know, go on the ocean or in the air. And then you have to, I don't know, race around a series of archipelagos or something. Maybe. Yeah. All right, well, let's yeah. uh, let's narrow down. It looks like we're all talking about doing an airship race. Chad is talking about doing an airship race. So I think that's the, the next thing we should go with. Let's try and narrow this down a little more. What kind of race are we going to do? Is it, uh, let's see, a Garund circuit going around the Mwangi Expanse and such, uh, to Goka and back, or perhaps too fast, too, fury, too fierce? <laughs> so that's Garund circuit... <laughs> Goka and back and too fast, too fierce. What does that last one mean? Well, <laughs> Honestly, is this a too fast, I don't want... fast and the furious yeah, reference or something else? Yes. It's totally a fast and the furious reference. It's just like over the top, ridiculous action hero. I don't know what that is. So, and so, I think that So would... is it a race or a heist? <laughs> 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 it might be a little bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> airships through other airships everything explodes well it could also be uh like you were saying earlier john that oftentimes there's sort of a twist it's not just airships it's there's a larger thing happening so it could be oh well we're flying in this airship race it's like the first one ever out of alkenstar and some big bad terrible thing happens and then it turns into too fast, too fierce, um, where you're now fighting this thing with the other airships or like trying to get away from whatever the big, scary, I don't know, flying demon is or whatever the thing is you have to worry about. Um, but it's certainly, a, it's a theme, right? Like you've seen racing shows and movies and you've seen like around the world in, in you know, however long adventure sort of movies, but then there's a, its own genre of like, racing cars and shooting guns and explosions sort of movie and and if that's you know the theme uh you gotta you gotta play into it right yeah i i i think i have an idea of where this goes <laughs> um because uh for the first two ideas that you posted up there both of them i feel are going to kind of play into that that concern that came up earlier of like you go to a place you do some stuff you move on you never see it back or never see it again. Mm -hmm. The Togoka and back one could have a little bit of repeat business, but I think we're still kind of perpetuating that same challenge. Whereas the idea of a Too Fast, Too Furious uh, model um, can be one that is a more localized race, which means mm -hmm. that the, the region itself can, again, kind of maintain a little bit of its own character uh, and, 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 and perpetuate the theme. Um, so what I see is <laughs> volume... Volume one, we do not start as airship racers. In fact, uh, Alkenstar has, you know, created four or five or however many airships. And it's like, we're one of the few places that makes airships. This is great. Let's do a, let's do a balloon uh, race or whatever. And um, everybody's like, wow, that's very cool. Except the PCs who, according to our um, player's guide, um, are all scalawags of the highest degree. Um, and the goal of the first adventure uh, is to be infiltrating the race 
in order Ooh. to seize one of the airships with the understanding that your goal is to abandon the race uh, and just fly off with <laughs> it and be like, aha, we have one of the few airships in the world uh, where the PCs <laughs> get wrecked. Um, however, <laughs> however, what we find on that airship that we seize is a whole bunch of uh, really uh, indemnifying documentation or other stuff that suggests that this airship was in fact being set up to, you know, win the race or lose the race or something. The race was fixed in some way because oh, there's some right, political gotcha. machination um, and even greater opportunity beyond having an airship that we could execute in Alcan Star. Um, so basically, it turns into this this Fast and the Furious heist style thing that keeps on having vehicle action. But one of the big hooks is that every single adventure path ends with not only the PCs acquiring a new thing, but part of that acquisition is acquiring a hook that conveys an even better press your luck risk and reward that brings you into the next book uh so it's like we got an airship but if we play volume two maybe we could run for mayor um level of thing you know? <laughs> maybe we could run for mayor well i would <laughs> I mean, also I probably keep upping the stakes <laughs> <laughs> I would keep upping the uh, the stakes where it's like at first it's like yeah you have this airship and then uh it turns into well now it's like this super fast like space and time bending airship it's warp step for airships um and then you're like wow no one else has this and this is how this one was rigged to win the race because it's using magic that it's not supposed to have and then you have to in true fast and furious way you have to go above and beyond that and to new levels of ridiculous every time maybe with magnets who knows but you have to oh! get like now it's a race to the moon or something silly so <laughs> oh my gosh, what i'm I hearing is we're going to end up on Akaton again. <laughs> the, the the thing you mentioned about maybe it has a magical power source, Vanessa, I think is really cool if we did a an Alcan Star adventure because you know they might be like, Oh yeah, this magical power source, it's gonna be great. This is NOS, but but for airships. Um until our our racetrack equivalent inadvertently has to redirect deeper into the mana wastes where there's malfunction. Oh yeah. That's cool. That would be fun. What happens and then that's something magical, you have to figure out how to deal with, yeah. has to crash land and re rebuild its engine to a different dynamic, but you're surrounded by mutant colos. <laughs> yes. To go back to one of the things Vanessa was saying about like relationships and things like this, you I think these dastardly scallywags are probably not necessarily going to be making as many friends and outside organizations, but who else is in their crew? Um, I know oh. that this is a lot of fun to explore with uh, Skull and Shackles, and who else do you have? Who do you who starts in your crew, and who do you pick up along the way? What kind of leads might they have, and also what kind of risks might there be in trusting other folks to join in your crew? Yeah, mm -hmm. that sounds like a really good a really good sort of subplot to go for. It might open up little side quests and things. That's cool. Uh, a thing that a thing that it reminds me of is is uh, like some various Bioware games like Mass Effect will tend to have oh, yeah. loyalty quests for your various yeah. uh, playable companions, mm -hmm. and so the idea of okay, we have it's us PCs and our seven very upstanding crew members, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and each one of them has their own little motivations and whatnot, and how many of those can you really fulfill and kind of turn into people who are there not just in order to stab you in the back later. So that when mm -hmm. the time comes, they're there to, to back you up. So that it's all about family. Oh, it's all about family. family. <laughs> <laughs> I just mean this has That's to be right. a 10 part adventure pass so we can get the full <laughs> Fast and Furious. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Do you think Mona would sign off on that? So, so here's uh, what we're doing. In 2024, <laughs> we are just doing an airship race the whole year. <laughs> Does this go above level 20? And then Vanessa's eyes light up and it's like, we can go above level 20? <laughs> <laughs> Quick, get design on oh that. We need rules for playing above 20. <laughs> oh my god. No, man, what remaster? We need airship races. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> what remaster? Yeah, oh get rid goodness. of the witch class. We want the airship as one of the core classes. <laughs> So, yeah, so so is an airship a class or an ancestry, John? Oh no. Yes. 
I feel that it, I feel that it should be more of a class because that provides you far more levers to play around with um, and starting abilities because a class would allow you to have several different uh, iconic mm -hmm. airship abilities like the ability to float. Um, it, like if you don't at least start with the ability to fly or float, then then what are you even doing? As opposed to going through a Strix style model where your airship doesn't truly gain the ability to fly until 17th level uh, with the right ancestry feat. And I feel that would kind of defeat the purpose of an airship. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Now Chad gets to see <laughs> Chad gets to see what shenanigans it is to have John as a co-worker. Every time you come up with an idea, he just like one ups it with some ridiculous thing that is absolutely brilliant. I would also so, like to point out, Vanessa, that the that these Wahoo ideas that started everything were the were were your ideas. So you you don't get to pretend you're not part of the, the shenanigan escalation game. I I, I am. That's true. I just so played the scenes. Ahead with, do, do we want to push ahead with uh, the 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 mana and the furious? Yes, the mana and the furious. That sounds or the amazing. Mana and the manic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, print it. Put it on the schedule. No, none of these are going on any schedule. Uh, well, that was fun. We're halfway through the uh, panel. We have a couple comments. Uh, Project JKO says, I need a, where the PCs get wrecked on a shirt immediately? <laughs> <laughs> I think I would definitely wear this shirt. Um, uh, Brian11 says, what type or die rolls do players get to do in a race is the biggest question. And I think that's definitely one of the things that we'd want to look at. So we do have some vehicle rules, uh, but what would we do? Would we want to expand on those? Would we want to try to use the existing vehicle rules? What sort of subsystems do you think would or might be needed to support this sort of adventure? Well, I have ideas, I think... but I know I start out all these answers. So Linda, do you have an idea? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that it, um, I would probably err on the side of not creating a, a super complicated overarching subsystem, but rather having so having a broad point tracker where you do different things that earn points and there can and that can be manifested in a wide variety of encounters. So you might have some that are like, oh, you know, this is a, a more lengthy skill challenge or some that are about like discovering new resources or fighting combats or things like that so that you can have in the background and visible to the PCs, a tracker. And it would be cool too, to have a visual for that tracker too. So if you're, if you're doing like a race or whatever, and then you can show like, oh, here's your ship and here's their ship and things like that. And they're, you know, after each round, you see where, uh, where each team is. I like the idea of a, a more long form chase. I think that's a, a really cool way of doing that. Um, I also think yeah. obviously we need airship building rules that are really robust, you know, different options. Um, mm -hmm. It would be difficult to do without already having like the star finder ship building rules, you know, to pull from because those are very involved. Um, so that would be a little more challenging to do in Pathfinder, but I think you could do it in small ways, right? Um, you could probably choose one of a handful of airship chassis. Uh, you might be able to choose from different uh, sorts of propulsion engines that give you certain advantages in parts of the race and disadvantages in others. Like you said, if it's a magic engine and you're over the mana wastes, you're going to go down. Uh, so that uh, I think I think you could probably do it uh, subsystem light using the existing vehicle rules if you really wanted to. Cool. He's like, you know, uh, the speed of the ships is going to matter for fight if they're fighting, which they probably sure. will. I mean, I'm sure these PCs yeah. wouldn't be above a bit of sabotage. Uh, their defense in terms <laughs> of hit points, their defense in terms of, you know, is their defense merely AC or might they have different defenses against different types of things? What is their offense and what kinds of offenses do they have and what kind of range do they have on them? Is all of their offense purely damage or are there ways to hamper obstacles as well like you're shooting a giant net cannons or something out of your out of your airship mm -hmm. and another question to deal with is how much of each individual adventure is race capital r like you are racing as opposed to setting up the race uh meeting doing crazy backroom deals kind of thing <laughs> uh, because that yeah, will tell you how in depth you want those systems to be. Because if it's all race, you better have a really, really solid system for it. Mm -hmm. True, and it, I, I think that's uh, a good question as well. Partly because it, it creates the um, like Starfinder Starship Combat uh, question, 
um, where it's like, um, if, if some of the people in the group really enjoy it, fantastic. What if some of the people in the group don't enjoy it as much? Um, is there enough variety that everybody's going to have parts that they're going to uh, enjoy? And, and if there are any parts or subsystems that they don't enjoy as much, then, you know, they still have tons to appreciate about the adventure. Um, one of the things I'll bring up uh, also is that uh, similar to how we have the chase rules that, that were brought up a little bit, um, we also just have victory point mechanics in general. Um, and sure. the idea of being able to use those to track or contribute to the greater race mechanic or even specific scenes like, you know, mm -hmm. oh no, there's a cumulonimbus cloud ahead and we're, we're headed right for it. Um, then there <laughs> are, this adventure I would assume would provide, uh, let's say like eight challenges that kind of uh, fill out this obstacle overall, like ropes are loose or, you know, the, 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 the rudder is stuck or whatever um, right. that are providing not only a variety of different things that uh, go into overcoming the challenge, and you can kind of by the end say how many victory points did you end, end with in resolving all eight of these things, and that'll kind of determine what your final success category is. Um, but also by breaking these things up into multiple uh, si sort of sub situations, then you get at a thing that I see in the comments, uh, Stun Monkey bringing up of like, you know, making sure that everybody has a chance to feel involved. You have a lot of different things happening at once that the PCs kind of have to split up in order to resolve, or you can't just have one person handling everything, um, which I think, again, is going to speak to some of that sharing the spotlight, sharing the fun. Yeah, and in addition to yeah. that, too, having those challenges, not only do has simultaneous challenges help, but also having challenges that call upon a wide variety of different skills. So nobody is going to be the best at handling all of the challenges. And mm -hmm. uh, when you have a lot of those victory point systems, you might have things where it's like, you know, everybody rolls at the same time and there's only a certain number of time ticks that you can do things during. So if the person who's the best at the skill does the thing and everyone else sits there, they're going to they're not going to be able to succeed in time. True. No, very good point. Um, there's uh, John, you stole my stunt monkey uh, question, but that's OK. Uh, there's a lot of really good, honestly, there's just a lot of really good ideas in chat for how to do different mechanics like that. I think this is an idea that's resonating with a lot of people. Uh, as we stated earlier, this is not going to be a thing we publish, but if you get it on Pathfinder Infinite, so be it. <laughs> um, you can yeah, hear the pain oh, in Vanessa's oh, voice when she says, this is a not, not a thing we're going to publish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you think airships is on this list? Asked and answered, Vanessa. Asked and answered. <laughs> That's okay. Um, cool. So we're a little over halfway. Um, I think we've talked about this quite well. We have a really good idea of what this adventure path is going to look like. Probably a three-parter. One where we're doing a heist and getting the ship. One where we're actually performing races. And then something bad happens and we have to fight our way out in ridiculous Fast and the Furious style. So... Uh, I th I think I think we have a good start uh, for this one, so that's cool. Um, so who's the our other villain? thing? So who's our villain? Oh, that is a good question. Who is our villain? Because like, oh. is is it is it an internal villain where it is one of the other racers? Is it a is it a nearly internal villain where again it's like you know whoever the mayor mayor of Alkenstar is or some sort of magnate or mogul in Alkenstar was fixing the race in order to achieve X, Y, Z. And we have to ultimately, because it's Pathfinder, go and punch him in the throat um, or, or something else. Um, Everyone does. So is it, is it an internal challenge or is it an external challenge where, you know, we are finishing up the race and then before you know it, we have an Avengers scene where, oh no, the sky, the sky aliens are coming and now we are the only one with a functioning airship. <laughs> um, for which I will raise a cautionary flag, which is if we don't, preview or foreshadow omg sky aliens then it's completely <laughs> out of left field and is going to in fact yes. diminish the storyline so mm -hmm. um like how how internal or external is our villain and how are they how are they getting set up over the course of the narratives that they're satisfying to track down and finally punch in the throat as a long-time Pathfinder Society player, I am biased, but I think our villains is the Aspis Consortium. And I think they are planning on rigging this race so that 
a specific, maybe not even their ship, but a specific ship will win so that they can, you know, bet all their money or a lot of money on it and make it rich and make it big. So I, I think... Uh, I think one of the things I would probably do is have like an underdog sort of ship uh, that's not the PCs that inexplicably keeps doing well um, or has a stroke of good luck all the time. Uh, and it becomes very suspicious uh, very quickly. And then it turns out, oh, I see that's the one that the Aspis has put a lot of uh, bets by proxy on. Uh, and then you're basically like, we need to beat them <laughs> because this is wrong. Or maybe we need to uncover the plot. So we need to beat them, but we also need to prove that they did this. One thing I like about the Aspis too is that it makes it easy to be like, you know, there's this particular silver agent or even gold agent or whatever who's like, yes. this is the person who's orchestrating the plot. And once you defeated them, you know, the larger organization, you can deal a blow to them, but they weren't really involved in this because the because the agents are fairly independent actors. Yeah, and another thing it brings in is uh, it can draw out its own motivation. Is If you happen to beat the ship that they bet on, the Aspis are going to be real, real interested in coming after you, and might, and that gold agent might even send some of their underlings to try and sabotage you, uh, which could probably anger the PCs a good bit, I imagine. So it's not even, oh, they're doing the wrong thing, it's, oh, they wronged us. Now it's mm. personal. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and, well, and even, even, even tied into that, quick, the idea of, go for it, Vanessa. Uh, from chat, uh, JW Magrum says, what if you find out you're the ship the Aspis are cheating to ensure win? So you keep winning when you really shouldn't, and then you're like, wait, Ooh. something's going on. That's deep. If one, you try to throw that, a race, then they, they you know, they're going to come and make sure you don't. <laughs> one, one thing that we tend to see in uh, video game media, but that is a lot harder to execute in a printed adventure uh, where we have limited page count um is it's really hard for uh paizo to create adventures that have really significant options or choices that are going to change the direction of how things go um like war for the crown it was toyed around with really early on that you might be able to choose which which pretender you're backing and then we realized how much that was going to just like create so much uh, dead space for all the options you weren't going to play. Um, but if this is the sort of thing where that binary choice is at the end, then that mm -hmm. presents far less dead space. Ooh. So it could be, uh, like, I, I think Josh bringing up, of like, what, what if you are the, or was it, I actually forget who now. Um, uh, where you uh, are the underdog. Ma Mangrum. <laughs> yeah, where, right. where, uh, okay. where, where you are the um, underdog that is, in fact, being rigged to win, and you are therefore playing into the plan. Whether you get to the choice toward the end as you discover that plot of like, are we going to follow through? And if so, are we like, are we with the Aspis now? Um, or are we going to throw this off, bork their entire betting pool, sink the local economy, but have an airship? Um, and I think in that case, you can provide like, you know, three or four pages to both of the two options mm -hmm. as opposed to writing two entirely different adventure paths. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really cool idea for the end. Uh, a nice, big, significant question that you get to ask, which is, is cool. It's always good when the PCs have those, those big, uh, world-changing things. Do you get a free airship and tank Alkenstar's economy? <laughs> or... or... <laughs> I know your answer, but and it also really uh, does a great job of writing the continuing the campaign article for us. Sure. sure. All right. I, I think we have really... Is, are there any what happens, if, what happens really? if you win of your own power because you figured out how to win and the, the Aspis Sabotage didn't factor in at all? But they're, all their bets like, are still on you. Yeah, all their bets are still on you, but I, I just wonder <laughs> like, if you discover like you, you discover like these things... I, I guess you could also like decide how many of these things you want to race with because it might be like, well, you know, this will make us faster, but like there's some chance that this is going to cause everything to go down in flames. So do we want to actually... Mm keep this on here to advantage us or do we want to take this off to and win f and win fair and square so to speak clearly we need mm. a heist against the bookies y yes yeah they can't, uh, I mean, their, they can't win their money if the bookies can't pay out yeah and and i what i'm thinking is uh the the bookie part is in fact one of the really important th things i'd explore in the continuing the campaign is the idea that 
the Aspis Consortium has kind of engineered this this betting these these uh, these, these uh, odds uh, to their greatest advantage. And sure, the PCs might have decided to win, get a cut of the profits, but the whole story, all of the cheating, has nonetheless gotten out. And now, kind of the follow up, continuing the campaign, villain is, you know, Queen What's Her Face from Bonkadyville, where it's just like, how I I bet a whole bunch of money thinking this was a legitimate operation. And now I'm very angry, and I have an army, so I'm going to track <laughs> down the the accomplices to this nonsense and punch them in the throat. Because that, that's apparently the verb uh, phrase of the day. <laughs> um, I. Re- I was thinking about, uh, and so was Chad, about what you said, John, about being careful that if you have a major plot decision choice and you put it at the beginning of an adventure path, you end up with a lot of dead space for the choice that the PCs don't choose. Versus if you put it at the end, you end up with uh, uh, not as much wasted space, but you can still have mm-hmm. a significant difference to, to split the end. Um, uh, Umbro Corvus in chat ask, how might you try and implement a choose your own adventure esque style? Uh, so, in choose your own adventure, of course, there is a lot of wasted space. Um, do you think that type of adventure is something that is is possible, uh, or is it just too much wasted words and art and space in a printed book? Uh, I think that I would be that... more of like a PDF type product. But what you could do with okay. something like that is use some of the design principles of sandboxes to be able to reuse content and and reskin things. So it's like, okay, yeah, you know, we have this group and if you find them in this context, then give them this ability. They are Aspis enforcers. If you find them in this context, give them this other ability instead. They are, you know, guards from the town or whatever. So then you, you have a, you have pieces that you can use on multiple routes, but that have subtle changes to, to make them still be applicable. So that it feels yeah. different, but it's not. Yeah, one hundred percent going to there. Graft, grafts and um, and, and templates are really our friend on that front. Um, the graphs mm-hmm. are kind of what it was referring to. Like, okay, are these hell knights or are these eagle knights? Or mm-hmm. put this thing on them, but otherwise keep seventy percent of the stat block. The uh, right. the template thing can also be part of the choose your own adventure from the perspective of uh, the airship design. Where, uh, you know, if we are in fact stealing an airship, then its original stats are going to be constant. But the various choices we make throughout the adventure, rather than saying, hey, players, here's a robust airship building system that you might only use a part of, instead creates a series of uh, uh, binaries or trinary choices where it's like, how did you resolve this thing? Okay, that determines if you get the bow ballista, the net gun or the the air taser um, as, as your <laughs> added thing. Um, <clears throat> so I think those sorts of things can allow you to build in a lot of those choices that don't entirely pivot the narrative, but can still provide uh, a meaningful uh, r- response to whatever the players decide. I think that's kind of the closest we can really get with a print product. Yeah, I think you would also oh. want to... Uh, make there be some differences in the treasure that gets awarded because as far as page space goes, treasure is something that has a relatively small footprint, Mm -hmm. but it can make a big difference in the things to the PCs compared to like all new encounters and things like that. Um, You could also rely on things that are already printed to assist you a lot. Um, So in terms of page space, it could be like, you know, you fight this, uh, level nine monster from the bestiary if you do this route or this other level nine monster from the bestiary if you do that route that way you're not spending a ton of space or you, you did the same with hazards as well that's a good point especially if you're doing airship racing uh the map is constant right you're on the deck of your airship okay cool um and there's sky around you fine uh so just changing out the monster i think is a really clever way of doing that so that way you don't have to print a whole map that you're not going to use uh you can just reference a different bestiary stat block so that's a good idea um or you might have a small yeah. pool for ground encounters that's like here's three maps that are appropriate you for forest encounters use that's this right. one for desert encounters use this one or whatever and then you're just using a, a pool of existing flip maps rather than uh drawing yeah. in a lot of you know art assets 
Similarly, uh, you can refer, we were talking about skill challenges earlier. You can, like at the beginning of the book, have a this kind of challenge, this kind of challenge, this kind of challenge, and just pull from those as the choose your adventure would hit, like, oh no, the sales have ripped, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And that way they just easily another, reference the skill challenge table. Another thing you can do for, for skill challenges that this made me think of is like how in organized play and interactive specials to uh, to save space, we've often had things where we say, you know, use an easy DC this check and or, or, or like a moderate DC this check. And if you have like the definition of what those are, or, you know, you can just use the definition from the, the core rule book of like, you know, the standard DC, the the hard DC, the very hard DC or whatever, then that way you can pull those challenges in at later points in time. And you don't have to say, oh, this, the, uh, the sale ripping challenge has to happen exactly at level two. The sale, there could be a sale ripping challenge that happens at level four instead. And of course, you know, you might eventually get to the point where you have a challenge that it makes sense for low levels, but doesn't make sense for high levels and vice versa. But that at least gives you some range of time in which that kind of thing can occur. Well, I got a related or a semi-related thing. If we're if we're good to move on, yeah, we've got about five whole minutes left. So, so with the foreshadowing point, um, particularly if we are presenting this as the ass was having framed, uh, framed or set up, rig the rig the race. Um, I'm thinking about different ways that we can start to. Uh, uh, a foreshadow that for as far as the players are concerned. So some of the challenges that they might come across have in fact been engineered in order to knock out various other airships. For example, um, that cumulonimbus cloud and storm and whatever that came up, that's because there are some Aspis folks who are using an orb of weather control or something like that in order to create situations that, you know, the PCs are only dealing with the, you know, kind of the, the rim of this cloud and storm, but it actually, lands right on top of one of the other airships. And it's like, these things keep on happening. And the, the mm -hmm. more of them that happen, the more that the PCs find clues that can help them to piece together that there is some intelligence behind all of this that's, that's setting this up. The other thing that can go into this goes back to your crew members. Um, if we have all of this backstabbing and backroom dealing and, and uh, you know, bad faith betting that's happening, What's to say that the PC's crew are, in fact, all just independent operators looking to get a fair wage on an airship? What if they're all basically in the pocket of one of the other parties that is part of this race or part of Alconstar politics or anything else? And so part of your earning their loyalty and whatnot um, involves either cutting whatever, whatever hook somebody else has uh, embedded in them that is forcing their compliance or is breaking their their perspective of what they think of their uh, real employer um, and and helping them see, you know, the deviousness behind it and, and how the PCs are, in fact, the, the good guys. Um, you know, I really have to use some air quotes there uh, or anything <laughs> else. But basically, um, each one of them, each one of your crew members has, in addition to their potential to kind of backstab a little bit later on, the potential to be giving you a piece of the behind the scenes story if you have earned their trust. I like that. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. That's cool. Um, all right. So and their trust have, can be like uh, both a, uh, sorry, both from like active social encounters where you're rolling with them and you may have certain opportunities to try that out, like sort of a longer term tracking thing, and also for the specific decisions that you make along the way. That's very cool. Absolutely. Uh, as much as I would like to talk about this for another hour, we have two minutes left until the panel is over. So what I'd like to do is um, if everyone wants to give uh, one piece of general advice for building an adventure for those uh, those newer adventure authors out there or aspiring adventure authors, uh, and also talk about where they might be able to find you on social media or however you can best be contacted, uh, we'll, we'll go through and do those. I will start. Um, once again, I'm Vanessa Hoskins, uh, and I can be reached at NinjaCatVanessa on Twitter. Uh, and my piece of advice is 
to make sure that the story has beats, that there are low points, there are high points, that there are easy encounters that help the PCs feel uh, heroic or capable or powerful, and that they're, those can contrast with those more challenging, like, you know, boss-type encounters uh, to really challenge their skills and their ability to work together. Um, so just make sure to include plenty of highs and lows uh, as the adventure progresses. Linda? I'd say that if you're coming up with the concept for an adventure, uh, don't be afraid to let it evolve, you know, uh, and to, to make drafts and things like that as you're writing. Sometimes you'll have something stuck in your head when you start and you're like, oh, wait, this doesn't work as well. Um, but, or, but then you're inspired by something else. And uh, the, I think the best adventures come when you really let um, connections form naturally, when you let ideas evolve and develop. As far as finding me uh, online, I'm oftentimes on the Pathfinder and Starfinder fan discords. Uh, I'm also on our Paizo events uh, server, and I have an uh, AMA thread, so feel free to ask me anything or follow up on any of the ideas uh, in this panel. As far as recommendation for adventure design, um, Vanessa featured the idea of having those moments of heroics and empowerment. I'm going to say agency. Um, examine what it is that the PCs are doing in the adventure and what what choices they really have and whether those matter. It's really easy to have the PCs become these um, characters who ride on the coattails of the plot line as opposed to steering the plot line. You need to really look at what what are they doing, what is their role, and how does that empower them? Uh, hi, I'm Josh Foster again. Uh, much like John, you can find me on the Discord. Uh, I also have an AMA thread. Um, and John stole mine, so I will say another thing to consider is making sure that everyone's uh, various playstyles are being dealt with. Not everyone wants all combat all the time. Not everyone wants to just have nothing but social encounters. Make sure you have a good mix uh, that suits, uh, if you know the players, your specific players, but if you're going for a wider audience, Make sure you're casting that wider net. Uh, you can't please everyone all the time, but you can at least give each group something in the adventure. Maybe one is more combat focused, but don't make it so only one kind of player can enjoy what you're putting out. I forgot to uh, say where you can find me, actually. Oh, uh, you quick. can find me on uh, the I do a stream uh, twice a week, Arcane Mark, which is on. Uh, Tuesdays and Saturdays, um, and you can find me on that as well as, on Twitch and uh, as well on its own Discord. Uh, tiny.cc slash arcane mark is the arcane mark official Discord. All right, fantastic. Uh, thanks everyone for being on this panel. Thank you for to our wonderful audience for help us coming up with a, a ridiculous adventure. Uh, and the Into the Darklands panel is next here in just a few minutes. Thanks everyone. <laughs>